just to recap, the coastal motor boat was a high speed torpedo boat designed by John Isaac Thornycroft to an admiralty specification. The idea was to have a, a shallow draft boat that could deliver a three quarter ton torpedo crossing nets and, and other obstructions in the water and was built uh, in a special uh, boathouse in Platsade near Richmond on Thames in London. This is the prototype under construction in 1916. And there she is a little bit later on, under almost ready for launch. I'm going to go very, fairly thick, quickly through all this stuff. So there is the, the prototype boat uh, 874 on the, on the river, just outside Platts 8 on the River Thames, going at fairly high speed, 35, 36, 37 knots. Uh, was the was the assumed speed that these boats would do, and they were very effective there. A few years ago, we decided to build a a, a replica. We started with very little information, <clears throat> but had we had more information, I suppose we would have decided not to build the thing because it's been a challenge all the way through. One of the first twelve boats is the forty foot boat, the CMB four which uh, was at the museum, the Imperial War Museum's uh, aircraft branch at Duxford in Cambridgeshire. So we went up to have a, a look at this boat prior to embarking on our own build. So down here on the, on the right, you can see my former colleague, Bob, sitting inside, having a look at what she's like inside there. We did a lot of planning on, on base on that. The real breakthrough in getting the boat underway was to establish that the Royal Museum's Greenwich in the plans and photographs section of Woolwich had uh, about 65 of the original plans of the 40 foot torpedo boats, the coastal motor boats that were 40 foot long. So we were able to purchase quite a number of these. Just briefly, I mean, the, 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 the clarity is not very good here, but you see a, a cross section at midships up, up. So then we, so we got various, Offset lines, offsets over here, which are critical to do things to do with the steering gear here, the general arrangements and so on, and the rudder. A lot of a lot of extraordinary detail. The critical one was the the general arrangement plan. These were never called coastal motorboats or torpedo boats. They were called vedettes, skimmers, hydroplaners, all sorts of things, submarine boats, but they never called them coastal motorboats. That was apparently a a, 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 a a camouflage term that was um, derived later on. This this one we this particular plan we have relied on greatly in terms of layout for the boat, as you'll see later on. And this one, of course, the lines plan. This is the very thing that allowed us to begin to build the boat. So we were able to loft it out on the floor, full size, and begin to build a boat. So we lofted her out on a, on a 45 foot floor on the on, in boathouse four, drawing off the plan off, off, off the plans and expanding them using all this sort of stuff here to develop the molds. If you look at this, the shape there, we've got a uh, station eight, I think, station yes. And John here has, has made a shape of the boat, the cross section of the boat at that particular place. Then the engine bearers were established. The boat was built off its engine bearers upside down with these big stanchions. So she's built about eight feet off the ground and the engine bearers are there. Then the molds are put to the engine bearers. And then gradually we were able to put the stringers on the boat here, put some knees into the, into the, into the stem there and build the chine log at the, at the, at the aft chine log there, which is a critical part of the boat's hydroplaning capability. We hope we will find out when we see trial. A lot of reinforcement was done here inside around the cockpit. The chine, the shaft log was built here. Connie here is, is putting in the various reinforcements. So you see the molds are still in the boat there behind her. So here we, we come up to a little bit closer up to date where we have start now to, to start skinning the boat with the first skin, which was done diagonally. Diagonal skin on the boat all the way through. 
so March 12th, 2021, about five weeks later, we are almost getting in towards the, the bow here. So it's a very quick process once we've got there. There's a three or four year process to build the boat itself with all these ribs and frames all over the place, the stringers all the way down. But then the <clears throat> actual putting of the skin on the boat fairly was, was a fairly quick process. So that's what she looked like about a year and a bit ago, 2020, no, sorry, 2021. So <clears throat> we'll bring you up to date in just a moment to where we were last time we spoke on this. This is the, the, to the, the she's totally skinned all the way up. And there we have the form of the step, which is the essential bit of the boat, which we'll talk about in just a moment. <clears throat> For those of you who have not been in this discussion previously, up above is CMB4, which you previously saw in a picture when she was at Duxford in Cambridgeshire. Fortuitously, I was able to arrange for the, the, um, uh, the loan of CMB4 to us in Boathouse 4, when she now sits up on, I, I like to say she's up on the davits <clears throat> up here, above the boat that she represents. I know they look rather, she looks rather small compared to ours, but I assure you that they are the same size boat. So the critical element of the boat here is the, the step. So if you look carefully at the highlighted point here, you'll see that we have this, this, this stepped hull. So there's a difference about four and a half inches between the point to the aft of the arrow versus the point forward of the arrow. The boat is flat all the way up until about here. And then at the back of the boat, the after the boat, there is this thing called the chine log where she's very squared off as well. This is intended to help the boat lift from the water when she reaches a certain speed. Obviously, you, you, you guys all know about displacement and so on. To make a boat go faster in the water, you need to displace less water. You need to have less friction with the water. So you need to have less contact area with the water. So this is the idea that she will lift once she reaches a certain speed. My technical engineer, Lorne Campbell, says that in our case, this should be about 17 knots that she should begin to hydroplane. We'll see. The step was built in the old days in this manner with Thornycroft at Hampton. We decided to build it slightly differently by laying out longitudinal stringers, if you like, on the on the deck, on, on, sorry, on the, on the outside of the hull a strong marine ply face <clears throat> for the step was produced, which was then put onto the boat there and then matched up against the stringers coming off and a lattice formation was put into, into place there. And then that in turn was filmed, filled with a, a, a series of foam that was um, solid, so, so, solid cell foam produced from um, old bottles, by the way. So we recycled stuff there. All of this was then made solid with the with the with the with the foam that you can see being filled there. So this just about brings us up to there's the step under 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 nearly finished, being fared into the existing hull, probably about late September last year. So there there you see almost the entire thing fared off. In the in the foreground here, you can see the beginnings of our torpedo, which we we we're going to leave nothing undone here on this boat. So there's a torpedo in the in the offing here. So that brings you up to date as to where we were from the last Zoom meeting we had. Following that, the next job was to turn the boat over. And in order to do this, because we had not yet put any, any, any planking on the deck, to do this, we built a, a large framework here, which will be the ultimate support for the boat when she's on display. So this is coming through from station two here, right into the bow, midships there, and then towards the aft there where you can see the cutout for the prop shaft. So that was that. We then lifted that on top of the boat. The, the picture on your left shows that framework being lifted up onto the boat, onto the top of the boat, onto the hull. And then to your right, we have the, the frame where she is then with the, with, the, with the cradle sitting on top, 
we then built a, a another cradle underneath her to lock her into position so that we could then on the left here she's fully locked into this sort of cradle box we could then on the right here lift her up on the cranes as you can see she's up there 10 feet up there's the old lofting floor upon which she was built she's now up in the air and then we dropped her down anchored her through the, anchored her to the ground through some cabling this way and that way and then gradually lifted her up and over all the way until she sat on the cradle the right way up so removing the rest of the box frame that was on her we began to see what the boat looked like we had no we had not seen her up up the right way until this time this was a sort of a revelatory moment in a way because we all we had done is ever looked at her upside down or, or from inside her upside down so here she was for the first time almost at the beginning to sort of it's like you know you're giving birth to something here and you realize this is what we've done it's quite amazing so here she is the right way up one view from the oh. up end, one view up here from just below CMB4, up above, looking at her down below. We stripped out some, all the rest of the support gear that was inside her. And there are some remarkable photographs, I think. So when all, all the support gear was outside the boat and away, this is what she looked like inside. And I, I, I have to say, I just think she looks astonishing here. A, a day or two later, I went to visit Salisbury Cathedral, and I was taken by the form of Salisbury Cathedral and the form of our boat here. She looks absolutely magnificent. No deck on her yet, but here you have the engine bearers running up through the boat all the way into the into the engine bay here, the knees, the various ring frames, and then the same over here looking aft with the engine bearers running all the way back. Nothing, no, no support work in there yet. Just, just basically naked boat, but looking quite beautiful. I was, I was delighted with the way she looked. Very quickly, we got, we went straight on with work to get her ready to put the deck on. Before the deck could go on, I wanted to get the support system in place for the torpedo trough. So these are the framework following the Thornikoff design. These are the supports, the sort of A A frame supports that will carry the torpedo trough along the line of the string lines that you can see in here. The Some dummy pieces to, to emulate the lifting gear were added to the boat. And then we began decking the boat, again with two skins of the boat. So I think down below is what she looked like when the first or second, first skin was on. On the right here, we we actually dumb it up. We we put the torpedo trough arrangement into the boat, so we know that when she was ready, we would have all this set to go. And over here on the top left, my my good friend Hamo Hamo Thornycroft, who is a instrumental trustee with the uh, Isle of Wight Classic Boat Museum, and great grandson of John Isaac Thornycroft, the designer um, of the boat, and um, I coerced Hamo and saying I, I don't think there's any I can't believe that you are not going to work on a replica of your great grandfather's boat so Hamo has uh, been a, a, a very very devout follower and worker on the boat ever since uh, last year then it was once again time to turn the boat over when she's fully decked so we went through the same process of building her up into this framework here and gradually with the cranes winching her over so she was upside down so that the she was going to go to our subcontractor, an agent called uh, Landau Marine, Landau Maritime in um, Marchwood near Southampton, and they were going to do the the rest of the work on the on, on the body of the boat, namely fiberglassing her and then doing the mechanical electrical fit out. So we winched her over here in November last year, and then she was lifted onto this truck with David Starkey and taken off to uh, Marshwood near Southampton, as I said. And then not many pictures there. So she was tented 
and fully fibred last, fared and fibred last, painted inside, as you can see. We've kept some of the woodwork bright, which you'll see in a, in a short while. Then over here on the right, some, well, actually on the left here, we see we're having a go at lifting the engine in. This is a Cummins QSB 6.7 liter marinized diesel. It should deliver about 430 horsepower, which is considerably more than the 250 horsepower delivered by the Thornycroft RY12 petrol engine. So we, we dropped the engine in here on this occasion. Uh, and then we, we realized that the fundamental mistake had been made and that the, the, the profile for the engine here was considerably different than the profile for the Thornycroft RY12. And we, of course, had built the engine bearers here as if we were going to put a Thornycroft RY12 engine in here. So in the event, it required Landau to cut these engine bearers down considerably because the engine sits much, much lower in the boat than the original, which is a very good thing, actually, in the end, because, of course, the center of gravity is much lower. Meanwhile, back at Boathouse 4, we had our, our Ukrainian uh, refugee volunteer, a man from the Kursan, which you've all heard of in the news recently. Fortunately, his daughter and son-in-law live in Portsmouth. He was able to come over and uh, spend some time with them. He still is. He took it upon himself to, the, to, to produce or finish off this, this fantastic looking torpedo, which uh, Ihor has worked on faithfully. Here it is looking closer. And here it is again, over here on the right. I'm sure he wants to write something amusing on it with, with love from Ihor to Vladimir, but we haven't got there yet. So, uh... And then back at Marchwood, um, as we progressed in, 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 April, in February, the, some of the, the, the castings arrived. Here you have on the top left, the rudder itself affixed to the boat on the, on the right there is the propeller bracket looking looking very very fine indeed and then over on the left lower corner is uh my colleague steve who's just managed to fit the make a temporary fitting of the of the dash dashboard as we couldn't call, call it into the boat for the bridge and in the foreground here is the is the very authentic looking 100 gallon stainless steel fuel tank for the boat and April, April 20th, the boat came back from Marchwood. So this is probably the best view you get of her here for the moment. She's fully fibred last. She's been painted in bright white. She's got a lot of the mechanical electric stuff inside her. With the David Stanley again, we're shunting her back into the boathouse. Looking very much the plastic boat that we didn't want to look like. So here she is on, on her first day back in the boathouse, very much looking like a, a boat that says, I am built for speed, I would say. Here's the cradle. She now sits exclusively in this cradle. And a view from up above with the, the forward lifting hatch here, the fuel tank you can see there, the dashboard just peeping out there, and the stays for this torpedo trough back there, all left bright varnished work back in there. Since she's been back, April 20th, that is, the primary project has been, the, the big thing was our um, contractors land up uh, boring out for, the, for the, the prop shaft. And here you see Mike over here diligently drilling with our fly cutter, our, our boring wheel, boring fly cutter into the, into the, into the boat through here. And then over on the right, you can see the moment when the stern tube finally made it through. This took all of a week for these guys to do. It was, a, it was an agonizing, difficult um, thing to do. The, the CMB has a very shallow uh, seven and a half degree angle of, uh, of inclination on the, on the stern tube. So they were drilling through something like six and a half feet of, of, of end grain wood to get that through there. It took a long time. So then this is this is sort of pretty much where we are at the moment. 
you this is we cleaned her up a couple of weeks ago for an open day so on the top left you see we now have the combings on the boat the forward lifting hatch combing the main combing around the cockpit we have the the rubbing rails down here the the tow rails down here a bit of tape on the deck there still to clean up on the forward lifting hatch there is the fuel tank and over here we have now made some adjustments to the to the dashboard here with a new strut there the steering wheel is going to go in the middle of the dash there in that position right there and then the engine is tucked back in there there is a lot more space in there than there would have been on the original boat this is a much much smaller engine the RY12 engine occupied nearly in the entire space of the inside of the boat. As you can see, she's a very shiny boat. She looks fabulous. I, everybody is most impressed, and I, I am too. And she's a great credit to the to the team that has worked on her for the last five years. I am most impressed by the caliber of the people who have I've had the pleasure to work with on this boat. So that's where we are in terms of the boat at the moment so this is largely where we are at the moment we are now in the process of putting some more electrical work inside the boat connecting up the dashboard and completing the steering arrangement she's a fly by fly by wire steering system i haven't touched much on that largely because we are await awaiting some pieces to be remade for the steering when the steering pieces came back some of them were not made accurately and we are having them remade which is why we are now delaying our launch trial launch and sea trials to the 29th of june we had originally planned to do them about a month earlier but the steering gear was incorrectly made in some respects so we have a little more time but in some respects that's good because we have more time to 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 finalize and high you know detail out the the rest of the boat so as i said i'm sure the the chairman or secretary will allow me a moment at some meeting to come uh in 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 the autumn in the fall when we will have hopefully successfully completed sea trials and at that point um we can then report thoroughly on the how well everything has gone i hope knock on wood so that leaves you with the boat largely as she looks at the moment. So we'll move on. And then I will, as I like to do with these um, discussions, I like to bring you up to date with a little bit of some of the research, because alongside building this thing, I and a, another colleague of mine are um, diligently researching and writing a what we will hope will be the, the book. We have a we have a, a, a publisher already in, 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 in who's accepted our, our proposal. And hopefully by February, March of next year, there will be the definitive history of the coastal motorboats available for you all to buy and have signed by myself and by Martin Kelly. So though I'd just like to acknowledge the fact that we have uh, many people helping us here. One of the great pleasures recently has been to go to the Isle of Wight and to visit Steen House, which is the first home that John Isaac Thornycroft had on the Isle of Wight after he moved down from Chiswick in the 1880s, where he built in the grounds of a lovely house, which was a house that was owned by previously and built by an admiral who fought at Trafalgar under Nelson. And the house is in the background there. John Isaac Thornycroft built as a water feature in his own garden, a test tank feature, which was both for the testing of boats, as you see on the left, and also as a, as a pure water feature to be enjoyed by, by the family and by the children and the grandchildren. On the left here, you have the, the, the lily pond, as it's now known. It wasn't planted with lilies until he bought another property nearby. And then to, to mark the redundancy of this particular pond, he planted lilies in it, and then it became known as the lily pond. Clearly on the left here, you see the lily pond in use as the test tank with the 
precursor of his notion of what would be a hovercraft running on the pond. On the right, of course, is the contemporary photograph, which I photographed in November last year. The system was a pond of about 50 yards long with a winding gear at each end uh, with a weight running into a, 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 a cylinder deep into the ground so that they could control the speed of the boat of the the model boat uh, according to whatever um, weights or, or, or proclivities they wanted to add to it there there is the pond on the right I'll draw your attention to the fact that over here there's a little barrage and a, a little weir and in a moment you'll see how that all worked out. The other end of the pond is th looking the other way, is this building here, which had the other end of the winding gear in it. These are photographs that have very rarely, rarely been seen. They're from the uh, Thornycroft family private collection. Here is the winding gear. Here is the boat on a little cable, little wire. And you can just about see the wire coming forward here. So this was all designed with weights and balances so that the boat would travel at a fairly uniform speed once it had fairly quickly after it had left the, the point of departure. The little weir I pointed out to you in the back is over there. So this was a water feature in the in the Thornycroft garden. And up here you see John I sitting with his with Mrs. Thornycroft and an currently unidentified uh, young girl. But you can see clearly that they are sitting up here. This is where the water ran out of the lily pond, down the weir, and then into this little pond, this little lake here, from whence it was pumped back up to the, the lily pond for further experimentation. I think this is all quite charming. I really do. I hope you all do too. So back to the, there is another, there is the same boat. I'm sorry, the same boat going there. One of the most significant players in the whole arrangement of the test tank facilities mm -hmm. is, is this lady here, whose, whose name is Blanche, Blanche Cools Thornycroft, John Isaac Thornycroft's daughter. Blanche was a self-taught nautical uh, naval architect and worked with John Isaac for many, many years, developing the test tanks and developing a recording system this is a wax recording wheel upon which the data for the the test runs on the boats was recorded and it's 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 worth highly worth noting that blanche was in 1919 1920 one of three women who were the first women to be inaugurated into the institute of naval architects blanche was a a, a phenomenal pioneering woman in a very highly male denominated area of, of work. Happily, I can say to you all that when we finally complete the boat, the, the, the CMB replica will be given a number for her bow, for her bows, and she'll be CMB 4R, as in four replica. But when we launch the boat, we will, um, I'm happy, delighted to say that we will have the name Blanche on the stern. As a, as a commemoration of the significance of this woman in, in, in naval architecture. So over here on the right, another picture of, of Blanche um, with, with a, a boat at the end of, the, of its run. In 1909, John Isaac Thornycroft bought the property just south of Steen House. And the property was no, none less, no, nothing less than a, a battery that had been built by the Admiralty to defend against the inevitable uh, invasion that never came from the French. So the Steen battery was built directly behind his property. It was never fortified. It was built with emplacements for guns, but never actually, their guns were never installed. The parade ground is this large area in here. And John Isaac bought this house, bought this, bought this entire property on Hillway Road, just outside Bembridge, and promptly built his own house in the parade ground, which is there today. 
This is John Isaac Thornicross House. This was taken uh, in November last year, largely pretty much as it was. And then he proceeded to build a new test tank. He decommissioned the old test tanks and built, put lilies in there and then built the new test tank, which you see here. Again, this was in this this was in October on the right side. On the left side, you see the building just after it's being commissioned, with none none less than uh, the, the 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 adorable Blanche Thornycroft there with her father John Isaac, and the, and the, the the magnificent building that they have built as their new test tank, sitting inside one of the what it would have been one of the gun emplacements for the steam battery, which you can still see under the in the undergrowth over here so it was an extraordinary honor for me to visit this place i have to say here we are inside the the test tank it's now empty because unfortunately there was a a, a drowning there in the 60s some of the local schoolboys would would get into the building to you know smoke cigarettes and look after their young girls and whatnot as they would, and one of them unfortunately drowned in there. But it's a, it's an immense building, probably 18 to 20 feet deep, I would think. And the reason for that, of course, being that they had no idea what the 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 effect of the friction of depth of the water. And somebody can come in and explain this better to me, but they didn't know what the friction of depth of water would mean. So they just built it as deep as they possibly could. One of the great joys of the place is that there are boat models lying around it's as if they drained the place and then they left it so here's a boat model of miranda three i think or miranda four this boat model here i i don't know what it is but they did test the cmbs in here so quickly there here's a lovely photograph which i enjoy from the very north west corner northeast corner of the building and it still looks just a bit like this there are several of these model boats boat models up on the wall still there's john i he, he he doesn't look like he enjoys having his photograph taken but but what we do know is that the family photographer was none no, no less than than blanche herself so you would one would have thought he might have been a little more at ease with his own daughter taking his photograph here we have in front of him one of the, the Miranda boat models. And then over here, going across the wall here, this is pretty much a progression of the Thornycroft high-speed boat models going from about 1882 to 1916 and so on. So you go from the, 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 the early sort of sea sled, not it wasn't a sea sled, but something like that, but the first indication of a stepped hull here moving the stepped hull slightly then then you get into the miranda group of boats here the miranda three miranda four uh, miranda four there and then you come up to the cmb here and so on so this this is the progression of boats that john i was building so when the admiralty put out the re the, the, the request for a high-speed boat to do what the CMB would do, three quarters of a ton torpedo, shallow draft and whatnot. He was at this, he was already at this point. He had built all these prior to that. He he was way ahead of the, the game in terms of what the Admiralty wanted. So th this is where this is where the CMB is, right here, right there. I lovely photograph. Another photograph of John I looking a little bit camera shy, perhaps, at the other end of the test tank where the equipment was set up to run the boat at high speed across the across the tank everything was controlled so they could they could they, they could they could control its speed and its its weight we've now recently just this the, two weeks ago come across some of blanche thornycroft's notes taken from the test tanks there showing the different speeds of the boats under the cmbs under different control situations with different weights added and we are working with the university of southampton hydrology department hydrographic hydrology department 
and we will be using their their tanks over at Southampton in the near distant future, near near future, to run some of the models to see how they notes that Blanche made in 1916, 1915, compared to computerized models in the contemporary arrangement using the original models from the Classic Boat Museum. Anyway, there's a lovely photograph, I think. What a perfect place. So I think Ian uh, had, um, Ian McLaughlin had asked me to talk briefly about the um, connection between the um, the CMBs and their, their and then the counterparts, the 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 hard chined hulls that were more prevalent in the Second World War. And I have to say, I don't know an awful lot about why the stepped hull didn't work in the Second World War and why the Admiralty favoured the hard chine. I have a firm belief that the the um the stepped hull had its limitations in terms of seaworthiness and ability to carry load and so the, the 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 navy the admiralty gradually very or rather quickly favored the hard china which would would have far more stability in in a in a heavier sea than the the um the rounded and stepped hull of the of the cmbs and i think that's probably and i invite this to be open to discussion i think that's the primary reason why uh, these boats did not carry on. They were very effective in the First World War, but the limitations upon them were that they could not continue to carry more and more load, and they would not perform better than a hard chine boat in a heavier sea. The hard chine boat here, we have our own MGB 81, a British powerboat product, uh, and the precursor of the, of the PT boat, no less, I'm very proud to be able to say that, Hubert Scott Payne Built these boats. the The government of the of the day in Britain tended to favour the Vosper version of the similar a similar boat. So Hubert Scott Payne, the the uh, owner of uh, the British Powerboat Company, took two of his motor gunboats of this nature to uh, the United States and was able to demonstrate them in front of Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and Roosevelt adopted the British design. Consequently, it was built in, in, in numbers by Elko and, and, and uh, uh, in, in New Orleans and other, other companies as the PT boats, which I always think is made famous by John F. Kennedy sinking one. But this is the, the, the British powerboat design is the absolute precursor of the, of the American PT boat. So here's a little tidbit for you all. Um, I, I came across this in, in, of course, research in 1941. The coastal forces was under uh, was under under development, and they were trying to decide which kind of boats would be favourable. And uh, our old friend uh, Augustus Agar comes to the fore, and here he points out in this meeting they they are, they are favouring the British powerboat sixty three boat, and then the um, other boats from Higgins and so on and so forth. In the minutes of the meeting, Captain Agar remarked that the present MTB appeared to be far too complicated to be produced quickly and, produ and when produced are inclined to be temperamental. He said it was not admitted that they could do a little more than the old, but not a great deal more. He also said the old CMB was simple to build with the result in a very short time, a large number were produced. So old Augustus was still hanging on and fighting for the production of, of CMB type boats back in, in, well into the Second World War. Of course, there were very few of them at that point. The only ones that made it into the Second World War were the 70-foot boats. Here is one looking rather fine. I don't know which model, which boat it is. It, it is in the 100-class CMB, 70-foot. It's on the measured mile down towards Rotherhithe. Three of these were built in the First World War, then recommissioned into the in the Second World War. CMBs 102, 103, and 104. And there is a very good view of two of the 1919-1920 built CMB 70 footers leading a couple of hard chine boats in the background there. I don't know which these are. They're either 102, 103, or 104. And then we'll go to this. And this will be my, my closing slide. As I said, we are about to um, 
begin sea trials shortly, which will in, involve making sure the boat trims correctly and bow, is, is probably ballasted, sets it nicely in the water. So I came across this slide today, or earlier on, mother, and I thought, my God, I hope we don't have to ballast the boat like this to make a trim properly. You will notice back here, she is full of sandbags. This is one of the 70-foot boats at Thornycroft's Yard on Platts 8, absolutely loaded with sandbags. I hope we don't have to go to that extent. Mm -hmm.